Let's see, I know that part is here somewhere. If you've got shelves full of boxes with different items in each box, you'd better have a system for finding the item you're looking for. And if you have a hard disk drive with 40 megabytes or more of information on it, you better have a system for finding the file you're looking for. Today, we take a look at hard disk management, problems, preventatives, and cures on this edition of the Computer Chronicles. Chronicles is made possible in part by McGraw-Hill, publishers of Byte Magazine, and VIX, the Byte Information Exchange. In print and online, Byte and VIX serve computer professionals worldwide with detailed information on new hardware, software, and technologies. Welcome to the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Chaffee, and this is Gary Kildall. Gary, when you take a look at a hard disk, and we have a hard disk drive over here, if I take the top off, you can see. I mean, that's it. You can't really tell very much about what's going on inside there. There are programs like this one which maps a hard disk for you. You can see where the files are. Still doesn't tell you that much. The question I have for you is, as a user, why do I need an optimizer, an organizer, a manager? I have a disk operating system. Why doesn't it do all this for me? Well, Stuart, there's no excuse for not having a good uh, utility set like uh, archiving and backup uh, tools for very large disks like this. Mm -hmm. But uh, there are a lot of utilities that really uh, uh, do things like reveal the data structures that your competition uh, might take a look at and, right. and use somehow, or uh, reveal uh, data structures to a user and they get used to that and if you want to change them with versions of the operating system, you can't do it anymore. Um, other things that are problems, if you undelete files and you're not knowledgeable about the way that, uh, that these undelete operations work, then you can also uh, get the wrong data back. Yeah, yeah. Uh, utilities will let you actually alter file allocation tables. Well, that could corrupt your disk. Mm -hmm. So in the hands mm -hmm. of, say, an average user, somebody who is not trained to use these utilities, uh, it could cause a real problem if you provide it with the operating system. If someone else sells it, right. it's not a problem. You went out and bought it, well, it's your problem. <laughs> well, Gary, today we're going to take a look at a variety of utilities that can help you solve your hard disk problems. We'll look at a disk optimizer, a disk organizer. We'll look at backup systems. We'll see the new disk doctor from Peter Norton, and we'll show you how to protect your hard disk from a virus. Now, again, if the basic operating system were more powerful, more friendly, maybe you wouldn't need all these utilities. Microsoft says the new version of MS-DOS is a more powerful operating system. We're we're going to begin by taking a look at DOS 4.0. The Businessland chain of computer stores has been in business long enough to witness the entire evolution of the IBM PC and its operating system, from the first A-prompt to the latest DOS shell. At the company's headquarters in San Jose, California, there are testing labs filled with samples of new hardware and software. One of the new items is DOS 4.0. Well, there are three major improvements in DOS 4.0 over DOS 3.3. The first is the break in the support for larger partitions on a, on a hard disk. Before DOS 4.0, we had 32 megabyte as a limit. Now it's, it's essentially unlimited. Also, there's EMS support built into DOS 4.0. The really, probably the most apparent thing in DOS 4.0 is the addition of a shell, the DOS shell, which is a uh, a friendly interface wrapped around DOS to make it a lot easier to use. And, and this is getting important because people are starting to have more and more files on their hard drives. The new DOS shell, with its menu bars and windows, seems tailor-made for a mouse, but it is meant to work with a keyboard as well. The colorful screen and extensive menus may also remind users of some other graphic interfaces. But DOS 4.0 is not an applications environment even if it looks like one. The DOS shell is really just the beginning to enhance the DOS environment. I think long term though the strategy for most companies and for people like Microsoft and IBM will be to gravitate those people into higher functionality OS2 presentation manager. DOS 4.0 has yet to prove itself as an acceptable standard among competing hard disk managers. But on the other hand, the dramatic change from a blank screen to one filled with information about files, directories, and the arcane DOS commands should make life easier for the everyday PC user.
Joining us in the studio now is Phil Grabmiller of Fifth Generation Systems, Inc., and next to Phil is Patrick O'Connor of Everex. Gary? Stuart, you know, we were just talking about hard disks, and right. one of the real problems with hard disks nowadays is, of course, they're very large, in many cases, like 140 megabytes or more. And one of the problems we have is backing up all instant information. Yeah. Uh, so what, as a result of this, what we do often is we just don't back up the materials. And if it uh, ever goes down, danger, we're in real big danger, trouble. Right. <laughs> so, um, Phil, you have a product called Fastback. Is that correct? Yes. Tell us a little bit about that. How do you archive your disk? Fastback uses the existing drives in the system to back up, and, uh, which is a low-cost approach to bringing uh, data backup and security into this, the uh, user's uh, uh, Life frame there. So mm -hmm. backing up from the hard disk to a floppy. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, what kind of compression do you do? You do data compression on the uh, ones and zeros, and what kind of you know, ratio do you Three get to one generally is what we look okay. at. Of course, when using bitmap files and, and uh, graphics images like that, it, you don't get as much compression. But on your word processing files and your spreadsheet files, you'll get a maximum compression ratio. Now, do you use standard file formats, or do you actually just dump this thing out to a floppy? No, we use the standard file mm -hmm. format now. We've gone back to that with Fastback Plus. So you can actually look at the uh, files when mm -hmm. you uh, go into look at your backup disks. Did you run through fast? Oh, sorry, Gary. I was just going to ask, just in terms mm -hmm. of, of backing up, if you were talking about, let's say you're backing up 100 megabytes, what would that time, what time would uh, Roughly that, that would take you about a half hour. Okay. And that would depend on the amount of data compression you put on the system and um, the uh, amount of error checking. And what would you expect in terms of the number of floppies that would result? Uh, that's hard to say. I'd say roughly... Uh, a lot. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> a lot. Okay. 100 megabytes? A lot. <laughs> Yeah, show us how it works here. Okay, Paul. this is the new Fastback Plus, and we have a new user interface here. Uh, also, we've added a help capability. You can be anywhere within the program and hit your F1 key and get uh, information on that particular feature. What you do is when you first get Fastback Plus, we encourage you to do a complete backup on your system. After that point in time, you can do what's called either an incremental or a differential backup, which is just adding to the original backup. What's the difference again between differential and incremental? Incremental is the difference between the last backup you did. Okay. Differential is between the original backup that you did. Okay. Okay. Basically here we're going to go in and we're going to tell it that we want to start with the C drive to back it up. We have some selection factors here where we can go in and do the include files. We can tell certain files that we only want to include. We can also do exclude. Let's say I want a lot of files but exclude a few. We can do files by date. We simply tell it where we want it to go, in this case out to the floppy drive, and we can tell it what type of backup we want. Here we have a full backup, an incremental, a differential, a uh, separate, a full copy backup. These are primarily for doing quick dumps of data without uh, resetting the archive for backup in uh, DOS. We can even estimate how long the backup is going to take once we're into the system. In this case, we have a hard drive here of about 80 megs, but there's not much information out here. We'll ask it to do an estimate here. In this case, it's going to take a minute and eight seconds to back up this, the data that's out there in the drive. Uh -huh. So we know how long we're going to be sitting there. We also know how many disks it's going to take up front. And we also have a timing factor here, which uh, runs as you're doing your backup. So obviously, it's not, this is not a full disk by any means. No, no. <laughs> yeah. well, what would good practice for a typical user be, then, in terms of how to use Fastback? We recommend once a day. Um, if you're a casual user with processing uh, spreadsheet files, uh, you, know, you, can, you can get by with once a week. But if you're uh, in a business environment or you're doing any type of uh, uh, accounting firm type of thing, we think once a day is, mm -hmm. is uh, more than appropriate. Phil, I want to ask you to slide the keyboard over to Patrick, sure. if you will. And Patrick, if you want to get ready to, uh, to show us your Everex system. What will be the cost of Fastback, uh, Phil? $189. And, and getting back to Gary's question, maybe not the 100 megabyte uh, hard drive situation, but you know, uh, how many disks you know, would you be involved with in a typical? You buy the product and you want to do your, your first backup. For uh, a 20 meg, you can, if you're using the new 1.2 megabyte floppies, one box of disks will get you by for a 20 mm -hmm. meg. Okay, and, and the, the, the compression you do, how does that relate to the speed? I mean, the whole point of Fastback, I suppose, is to speed up this process rather right. than just simply making copies of these things. The timing of the backup does slow down if you put on the uh, data compression. What you're doing is that you're asking to do an extra process there, yeah. which is to squeeze these files down, and you're also asking it to do that on the restore. Uh, so basically, it's going to take a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. It's hard to estimate exactly. Okay, Patrick, you've got a, another more heavy-duty approach here, and tell exactly. us about your system. What we have here is an external 125 megabyte tape drive. So what you're really getting, it's an external unit along with the drive mounted internally there. Um, comes with software and additional controller card, which is mounted inside your PC. And about what cost is that? Just to this uh, uh, retail would be $1,800. Mm -hmm. And who's the kind of user now that wants to use your tape streamer system as opposed to Fastback? You'd see it more in a corporation or university environment, real heavy power users. 
people who do you know massive amounts of disk utilization as well as you know need large backups. Could you show us how you would do this? Sure. What I can do, let me show you a, a real quick uh, file by file backup. What you can do is simply tab around off the main menu. You're going to be bringing up what uh, Everex the um, easy easy user menu there, which you can do also if you're more of an engineer type. There's a more advanced kind of menu for mm -hmm. those into the bits and bytes. Back to the original, what you can do, basically that would be uh, entering all the different file names. I'm going to, the next question would be, would you like to include subdirectories or append or overwrite? I'm going to overwrite, F8 or execute. What you also see on the side where it, under the line tape, it's highlighting exactly the process that it's going through right now. Right now it's rewinding it, preparing the drive, and then what you'll see is, again, you're going to see a bar chart at the bottom, basically telling you how fast your unit's running and exactly where you stand in the backup process. Let's ask some similar questions. Let's say uh, 100 megabytes. What would that take in terms of time? Uh, it's five megabytes per minute backup, so that'd be about 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And in that case, 100 megabytes would fit completely on that one cartridge. And I guess. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I was going to say you also have the, uh, the same sort of features, so you can archive only those files that have changed and. Right. You can right. select mm -hmm. any which way you want, whether it's you know certain files, the whole disk, what's been modified, you name it. How does this compare to, to other backup systems? I mean, we know the Bernoulli boxes and so on. Right, well, what you're, what you're really going to find the key is, is going to be the software that's out there. Bernoulli is a removable media, right. um, which is more of a disk base. This is a real cartridge-based system, so it, it operates actually a little bit differently. Um, Bernoulli is used a lot in, say, the banking industry, mm -hmm. where they want to um, actually take that and archive it. This is different. It's, it's really meant for, say, a lot of networking environments where you want to just take your cartridge and then put it right back in. What about standards? Are there any standards that have uh, set up for, these, these, uh, for the format, for the tape? Yeah, exactly. There's actually a couple industry standards, uh, mainly re relating to the controller card as well as then how the information is put down, Quick 24, Quick 36, Quick 02. So those, a lot of them, basically all the 10 manufacturers of tapes follow all of those. Are our optical storage devices going to sort of make tape streamers old-fashioned? Uh, I, don't, I don't think so, to be quite honest. I think what you'll see is the technology will move down. Uh, a streamer will then become used in a home, and I think an optical is still going to be high-end in a couple years out. Uh -huh. Okay, gentlemen, thank you very much. Now, backing up your hard disk and worrying about disk crashes is one concern you might have for your hard drive. Another concern these days is a virus getting into your hard drive. Wendy Woods has a report on how to avoid these invading viruses. This is a Macintosh owner's worst fear, a hard disk crash. The operating system is gone, and a virus is the culprit. Symantec designed a virus for us to show how quickly it can work. Within seconds, this Trojan horse has wiped out the disk's data directory. Fortunately, Symantec makes a product which can warn a computer owner that a viral attack is imminent. Part of the Symantec utilities Guardian, when installed before a virus strikes, will stop the bug in its tracks. Guardian itself will basically prompt the user if, if the virus starts writing the disk directory information. Guardian will prompt the user that there is an illegal operation attempted, and at that point the user is aware that there is a virus in his system, and then he should attempt to get rid of it at that point. The utilities also present a good chance to restore a hard disk following a crash, even if they hadn't previously been installed in the system. There are two, kind, two kinds of Macintosh users, people who have already crashed their hard disk and people who are going to crash their hard disk. So with Guardian, basically, you'll, you'll solve that problem. With viruses very much in the news these days, it's no surprise that these utilities are selling well. In fact, Symantec says it's the most popular program of its kind, with some 10,000 units being shipped each month. In Cupertino, California, for the Computer Chronicles, I'm Wendy Woods. With us in the studio now is Steve Koshman, Marketing Director with Peter Norton Computing. Next to Steve is Ted Knox, Technical Marketing Manager with Golden Bow Systems. And next to Ted, Frank Tantalo, President of Westlake Data Corporation. Gary? Well, we have a leftover here from the last segment. Yeah, right. I wanted to <laughs> see that. <laughs> this is the actual cartridge that uh, was used in that streaming tape drive. 125 megabytes, yeah. $40. Not, Not a bad, bad little piece of equipment. A lot, a lot of data in there. Mm -hmm. uh, Frank. 
You've got a product called Pathfinder. We have three demos here to do. And uh, can you show us a little bit about Path Pathfinder? Tell us a little about, show us a demo. Sure, Gary. To manage all this data on these large mm -hmm. hard disks, which are becoming very prolific in the computer world, one needs a shell to take advantage of the DOS tree structure that uh, Microsoft and IBM have provided us. Pathminder, as you can see, has got many functional areas. It's a file manager, directory manager, built-in editor, it has many other options, applications manager. One of the easiest things to do is create a directory. Let's just make a directory. We're going to call it test2 test to differentiate from test1. And as we can see, test2 is now created. Mm -hmm. Let's copy a file, this particular file. File, copy, subdirectory. We'll mark it. Confirm it. It's copied. Go down to test2, and there it is. We can now also move this file very easily using the same marking procedure. File, move, which one? This one, where we want to move it. Let's move it up to DOS. Because it ba basically, Frank, you're saying you would use this instead of your standard DOS commands to do your typical oh, sure. file management it, tasks. It interfaces between you and the machine. There is no typing error. There are no syntax errors. You tell it the procedure to do it, and the program does the translation. It seems to have a little bit of a, the look of a Lotus. Is that intentional? Well, we feel a Lotus-style moving light bar menu is probably the easiest thing to use. Uh, the, the command that's highlighted on the top line is always explained on the second mm -hmm. line down to the level of execution. Okay, when you load this in your machine then, I mean, this is the interface. I mean, you turn on your machine and you get to Pathminder, and then you navigate from there? That is correct, sir. Okay, well, I want to ask you to turn that keyboard now over to Ted. We want to take a look at the next hard disk problem there, and that's disk optimization. Ted, and can you talk and uh, press keys at the same time? Sure. Okay, tell us about Vopt. What does that do? Well, what Vopt does is it defragments your disk with uh, normal use DOS takes files and it fragments them out on the disk. What this means is when you copy delete files, mm -hmm. when you update existing files, you tend to get fragmentation on your disk. And Vopt makes those files And why is that a continue. problem for a user, average user? Well, what that does is that uh, because the files are in separate locations on your hard disk, it causes excess wear and tear on the hardware, and it costs you time. So once the, the files are contiguous, they're faster. Your mm -hmm. applications will will be faster with Can you run it Sure. So what's the first thing we're going to see, Ted? This is a uh, map of the hard disk. It shows uh -huh. the, the blue uh, frames are actually contiguous clusters. So that's sort of the good stuff. Right. Okay. Right. And what we're concerned with are the yellow patches, which are fragmentation on your disk. Okay. And we'll go ahead and show you how those are cleaned up with the VOP program. Okay. So you then run VOP, and what would happen? Just give us a sort of play-by-play -play here. Sure. What we're doing here, with the first thing we do is we run a check disk to make sure everything's in order. And then we go ahead and, and we take a look. And the first thing, what that just did was take all your fragmentation and copy it out to the end of the, uh, the disk, one file at a time. Now what we're doing is uh, taking and restructuring the files so that we'll, we'll move the files back to the front end of the disk while they'll run a little faster. What you're, you're seeing in the display to the left is how many files are being moved. So you get a good idea of, mm -hmm. of what went on once the op was finished. It will also tell us once it's done uh, how long it took and other information about your directories, uh, the sector information, and so on. Any way to quantify what the improved performance might be once you go through this sure. process? Sure. What, uh, what a lot of the, uh, what the, the best way to do it is to run the applications that take the longest. Mm -hmm. uh, whether you're sorting a DBase file or uh, working with a spreadsheet and just time them before and after you run. But, I mean, you could notice a difference. Sure. Yeah. You should be able to notice a difference. Um, also, we recommend that you run it as a batch file every day. You see it runs very quickly, and that was on a disk that hadn't been uh -huh. defragmented. Okay, Ted, I want to ask you to slide the keyboard over to Steve now. Sure. And Steve, you're going to show us the new version of Norton Utilities and all its fancy tricks. And the first thing you're going to do is actually what? I'm actually going to replicate a very common uh, error. You come in in the morning, you boot your computer up, and nothing happens. Okay. So what I'm going to do it, actually is I'm going to Okay, you're slipping a floppy into the... I am uh, going to run room. the Norton Utilities. Um, and 
actually. Just sort of give us a little description of what you're doing there. As okay. You do it, Steve. What I'm doing here is I'm going to run in Norton Utilities, uh -huh. the utility, and I'm going, as I said, I'm going to replicate a very common error. When disk drives uh, crash in the old days, it literally was a crash of the hard or the head yeah. into the magnetic uh, medium or the platter. That no longer usually is true anymore. So what happens is normally when you, I'm going to explore the disk here, I'm going to choose an item, and I'm going to go into the absolute sector. One of the things, um, I'll edit this information, and this is the, what's called the master, or master boot record. And what I'll do here is I'll go to the hex table, and I'll literally um, replicate what happened if, for example, you were working on, you were working on, on a, saving a file to disk or whatever, and you had a power search or whatever, you would get a hiccup, and these bytes would actually be overwritten by zeros. Okay. All right? I'm going to enter that. I'm going to write to the, to the disk. Yes, right. I'm going to make major changes. <laughs> I'm going to crash this thing very hard, okay. and I just did. Okay. Okay? Now, if I'm going to exit out of this program, and what I will do then is I'm going to turn the, turn the machine off, okay. and uh, just like you come in in the morning. Okay, so you now... Get the switch down here. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Right. Now, we come in in the morning. Right. You turn your machine, turn the computer on, and you wait for it to boot up. Okay, and what should we be seeing then? Well, you're going to... It's checking for the RAM, okay. amount of RAM right now, and this machine has, uh, has about 1.6 megs. Okay. Uh, it's, it's got extended memory in there. And it, this is very typical. It looks very normal. Right, it looks good so it far. It looks good so far. Now it's checking the RAM, verifying it. And now it's starting to read for right. the command com um, from DOS. And it went to the A drive. There's nothing there. Now it's going to the C drive. And nothing is there. Right. You're back mm -hmm. into straight basic. Right, OK? Right. Now, being a uh, relatively sophisticated PC user, you know there's more than one way to boot a computer. So you go get your MS-DOS disk right. and put it in. And you try, you try to do that. And you know, you're you hope you can get an A prompt. So let me do the Alt Control Delete, okay. and we'll reboot the system. And what do we expect to happen now? Well, what we expect to happen now is we'll get our standard DOS prompt, the date, the time, and hopefully uh -huh. uh, the A colon. Because now, once we're into DOS, we can see what's wrong with this with C drive, if anything, is there. And yes, the disk light's still on, so it's reading it. Okay, and so here we go. Yes, we are. We are in DOS, and I'm just going to say Enter. Okay. Is your now, prompt? So now, half the battle's done. <laughs> Whoo. Okay. Let's go find the data on the C drive, and let's see what it looks like. The Invalid. PC user's worst nightmare. Right. Invalid it drive. <laughs> it is gone. And if you're like most people, you try it again, you know, I mean. <laughs> and think of it, when was the last backup, right? When was the last backup? <laughs> That's exactly right. Uh, and and this, is the, this is the problem. And this is what the Norton Advanced Utilities now will correct. Not okay, only let's, see how, let's see it okay. fixed. Yeah. Let's see it fixed. OK. Mm -hmm. What I need to do now is, is the disk one from the advanced utilities, which has the what's called the Norton Disk Doctor on it, and install it. And we'll run it now from a bootable drive, which is A. Okay. And I will type NDD for Norton, Norton Disk Doctor. Mm -hmm. And what it will automatically start to do now, diagnose and tell us what's wrong with the hard drive. Before, and there's, before mm -hmm. this, it was the only thing you could do was take it to a tech repair right, shop. Right and uh, very, very sophisticated assembler and hex uh, programming to try to reconstruct So what's it, it telling us? First of all, right off, there's no partition table, which means there's no master, master boot record. That's why you have the invalid drive specification. So how do you continue with that one then? All we do is say yes. Mm -hmm. sure. This is what the disk doctor does. Now, there, this is a large, this is a 90 meg hard drive, so we'll see if we have more DOS partitions. Yep, it found another one. Uh -huh. What it is now doing, we're reviving the various partitions. Oh, there's another one. Okay, and we're searching, we found them all. Okay. All right, finish searching, we say okay. Now in order for this to happen, we need to, re, uh, to change to take effect, we need to reboot, and I will say, yes, reboot. Uh, we're taking the floppy out okay. now, and we should go right to our C drive, and let's see if the data's okay. restored. So you, you didn't only uh, recover a lost file, you recovered the entire lost disk, basically. Right, and, it, and there it is. Okay. So, <laughs> From, from no C prompt, invalid drive specification, you do get the C prompt. Let's see if the data is there. And there sure is, enough, yeah. and there it is. And, and in fact, Norton Disk Doctor uh, diagnoses many common problems in addition to the partition table or the master boot record being uh, fronked or damaged. Uh -huh. Many file allocation table errors like lost clusters, 
as reported by check disk or cross-link files. The disk doctor, again, automatically diagnoses those, reports them on screen, and asks you if you want to fix them, yes or no. Say yes, it will automatically fix them and generate a report at the end for you. Great, gentlemen, thank you very much. That's our look at hard disk problems and hard disk management. We'll see you here next week again on the Computer Chronicles. In the random access file this week, Compaq has introduced what it says is the most powerful desktop computer in the world. It's a new 33 megahertz Desk Pro 386. Compaq says the 386 is 35% faster than its 25 megahertz 386 and can handle 1.3 gigabytes of internal storage more than any other desktop PC. It features integrated VGA graphics, standard interfaces, and eight expansion slots. The basic model with an 84 meg hard drive will sell for around $10,000. Now that you've finally converted everything from five and a quarter inch floppies to three and a half inch disks, along comes Zenith and announces it will be using the even newer two inch floppies in its new generation laptops. The two inch floppies have a capacity of 720K. A Zenith spokesman predicted the two inch floppies will eventually become the standard. Grid Systems has released a new modem specifically designed for use with cellular phones. It offers sophisticated error detection to handle cellular transmission problems, comes with a security password utility, and runs at 4800 baud. It sells for $695. The Macintosh laptop is not due out for at least another three months, but one company is now offering a Mac laptop kit. The kit includes everything you need to build a Mac laptop, except the Mac motherboard, drive, keyboard, and mouse. The Travel Mac kit is being offered by Nexus. The price is $17.95. Apple is set to unveil new networking products for the Macintosh, including new hardware and software that will enable a Mac to hook up to an IBM token ring network and another product that will let Macs exchange files with DEC VAXs. Well, the trouble with innovative new software is that it's often hard to explain what the program does. That's certainly the case with one of the most interesting new software products to come out. It's called Idea Fisher and it's a program designed to help your creativity. It's basically a gigantic cross-reference database of words, phrases, images, and concepts. Start out with one word or idea, and the program will branch you out to all possible associations with that concept. The program contains 25 megabytes of data. It's designed as a creative tool for writers, marketing or advertising people, or anyone involved in brainstorming. It's being sold by Fisher Idea Systems of Irvine, California. Finally, the case of the fax backfire. In Connecticut, Governor William O'Neill had on his desk proposed legislation to ban unsolicited fax messages. Opponents of the bill lobbied the governor to veto it by flooding him with faxes. Fed up with all those unsolicited faxes, he signed the bill. Starting in October, Connecticut will be the first state to make the sending of unsolicited fax advertising illegal. That's it for this week's Chronicles. We'll see you next time. The Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by McGraw-Hill, publishers of Byte Magazine, and VIX, the Byte Information Exchange. In print and online, Byte and VIX serve computer professionals worldwide with detailed information on new hardware, software, and technologies. For a transcript of this week's Computer Chronicles, send $4 to PTV Publications, Post Office Box 701, Kent, Ohio, 44240. Please indicate program date.